uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers for this evening, uh, Barbara Schubert and Steve Rosen, who are uh, nearby residents, and um, we'll be talking about the history, as you see, of um, the carriage trail, which we all know as Ireland Drive, um, from pre-revolutionary times through the present. Um, Barbara's up first, uh, no, yes, Barbara's up first, and she is a retired costume artist and a political activist, community builder. She um, founded uh, Save Our Trails about five years ago, and we'll be talking about that organization tonight, and she's committed to that organization and to Ireland Drive. And then uh, Steve will be giving us a history, so we can, um, we can all take notes. I think there will be a quiz afterwards, so. <laughs> and please feel free to enjoy our refreshments as the evening continues. Thanks. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. So nice to see you all here. You don't have to take notes because everything is in that little booklet. Um, first, let me say that Steve and I, when we bought our house in Forest Glen Park, that adorable neighborhood over there, um, we didn't know anything about the seminary. We didn't know anything about the woods. We knew there were trees. That was the main thing. And it seemed like it seemed like every day we discovered another wonderful, amazing thing about living in Forest Glen Park. And of course, the seminary and its uh, rebuilding has been one of the great highlights. I, I just feel so, so lucky to be in such an interesting, exciting environment. You just sort of need to talk right into it. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so we came here in 2002 or three, and, and around 2006, well, we, we used the trail a lot just to walk in the woods. How many of you have been on the carriage trail and enjoyed it? Well, just about everybody. Um, and we were amazed one day to see a sign or, or to learn of the imminent closing of the entrance <coughs> to the trail right up behind the new townhomes. And we were kind of irate about it. It's like, how can private property construction close a public entrance to a park? So we went down to the planning board and discovered to our dismay that the property is in fact, was and is uh, army property. And that is why they had the right to close it off in order to uh, permit the construction that was going to take place. So. I think I just about immediately ran home, being a, an activist, I don't complain, I do things. So I made this really crummy little sign, you know, probably got more attention because it wasn't made on a computer, and just said, you know, if, if you don't want this entrance to be closed, please sign up, we need your email address, because if any of you have been involved in grassroots politics, you have to have a constituency. So that was, you know, it couldn't just be Barbara and Steve. So um, we were very successful. People were terrific. Uh, sometimes we couldn't exactly read what they wrote, but eventually we actually collected about 400 email addresses, and then building a coalition, we, um, we got on the listserv for, I think, three other neighborhoods right in the vicinity, and also the natural uh, partner was the Washington Area Bicycle Bicyclists Association because they depend on those uh, bicycle trails. And also the Audubon <coughs> Naturalist Society was very kind to join us as well. And finally, we had uh, good support from Friends of Rock Creek Environment. At that time, they were brand new. And I don't know if you know, have noticed their work. They've grown tremendously. And their interest, of course, is the creek, uh, Rock Creek. And we have a tributary uh, that goes from the Walter Reed property and empties into um, Rock Creek. So that was our coalition. And I um, can't remember the exact order of all of our things. It seemed like I was working on it all the time. The big breakthrough was when we were able to uh, have the, um, well, first, we did go to some community meetings that the Army held, and you know I pitched my thing, and, and the commander was very, very nice, but he said, you know, I'm not the one who makes the decisions. But nevertheless, the Army was very generous and cooperative and allowed us to use uh, um, 
a strip of land that was inside the existing fence, in other words, on their property, and the developers here paid for and had installed that fence. So that was, I thought that was just a wonderful cooperative solution, and we used that until the construction was done. So that was, I thought, the first uh, triumph. Um, and then, the one thing that I feared the most was that since this didn't belong to the public, there was a threat that it would be closed, although it had never been closed. As far as I know, it's always been open to the public, probably since 1774. And yet, sure enough, in probably it was just 2008, the Army had uh, part of their master plan for BRAC was a new building, and they insisted they required better security. So they had drawn on this little master plan a fence that went right across, which would have kept everyone out of the southern part of the trail, which included the <coughs> picnic house. So that's when I really got to work. And with the help of Chris Van Hollen, uh, Congressman Chris Van Hollen, uh, his office did a great job, you know, getting the Army and, and the Parks Department and us together. The Parks Department, I thought, should own it. As it turned out, um, that wasn't so, wouldn't have been possible because they didn't have the budget. But we did, um, one of the biggest problems was the reconstruction of the destroyed bridge. How many of you had the pleasure of crossing all of those steel plates? So you know, uh, it was just on the verge of collapse, which probably would have closed it off to the public because of the liability. So it was an amazing thing to me that, in fact, Walter Reed Command did come up with the money, $400,000, a lot of money. And they did a wonderful job completely restoring it, fixing the stream banks and so on. So that was just terrific. And at that time, we thought that, still at that time, we thought we should be able to turn it over to the Parks Department just as, as some land had been in the past and just as the National Park Seminary property was turned over to the county. But, so, so we had to convince the Parks Department to want it, and uh, which we did, and we met with the Director of Parks. It was very congenial. However, it became clear that even though the Army was willing to give an easement for part of the Ireland Drive, they would require the Parks Department to keep up with the maintenance. So the Parks Department can't spend money on land they don't own. End of story. So that never happened. In the end, it was really a happy accident because a couple of years ago, Walter Reed turned over the command to Fort Detrick. Now, I'm new to the Army, so I thought all the Army is kind of monolithic and everything they do is the same, but no, each command apparently has its own criteria, its own agenda, and part of the Fort Detrick agenda is an environmental agenda. So lo and behold, Fort Detrick has a budget, has a plan, uh, and they have already begun to remove the invasive plants, which were ki killing uh, the trees and vines were smothering everything, and pretty much all that's left there were non-native invasives, and it's still that way. But at least they have made a great start in getting rid of a lot of that. And they're committed to continue. They have this whole program. So, you know, wonderful. And I guess eventually they'll be able to replant it with natives, so that's just terrific. Um, where am I, Steve? What have I forgotten? Uh, so today, I, I feel as though the status quo is really pretty good. We've we've gotten the um, we, oh I'm sorry I forgot Walter Reed when they turned it over to Fort Detrick that horrible fence disappeared, and I, I, I assume is because we made a big 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 stink about it. And uh, I, I have to thank my neighbors who came out every time I said, we need your body, you've got to come, and they did. Also, I have to thank the Gazette, because they came out too. And they made very pretty stories about how cooperative the Army was, which is fine with me. And uh, so, taken all together, I think we won. So here we are, and I'm just not really that worried about it anymore. 
even if they should decide later to close it off, uh, Congressman Van Hollen said, you know, his office said, you know, they know how much you care about it. They know that the public will rise up again, so it's unlikely that they will close it. But naturally, it, they own it, so we have to keep our eye on it and make sure they follow through on their promises and never, ever close it to the public. <laughs> when, when Barbara started this and we wanted to build uh, public interest, we started looking into the history of the trail. Really, in the beginning, as a spinoff of the seminary, because you remember that the trail was an important part of the life of the seminary. Uh, as a matter of fact, the trail was paved by the seminary in 1928, the uh, concrete trail. By the way, Barbara, only about half the people put up their hands when you asked how many of you have been on the trail. Apparently, half of you have not been on the trail. And you have a big treat ahead because there is a magnificent trail that leads down the hill from the, far, uh, the uh, National Park Seminary to Rock Creek and goes in a great arc. It joins, it's concrete paved. It joins up with an asphalt paved trail that goes across a wooden bridge to Jones uh, Mill Road. Uh, and it also leads to a variety of dirt trails that go along Rock Creek for many miles. And it's a wonderful trail for hikers, bikers, dog walkers, and if you haven't been on it, it also turns out to be quite a historic trail. When we started looking into it, we were astonished to learn that the history of the trail is bound up not just with a very long history of this area, but with some of the most illustrious families in the history of the American Revolution. As a matter of fact, the trail was established by the Carroll and Brent families. Let me tell the story briefly. Originally, this plateau that we are on and the adjacent hills that descend toward Rock Creek Park were the uh, wandering area of the Piscatoe Indians, uh, whose history is only barely written and not that much is known. But you will find in this forest the, some uh, shards of the arrowheads of the Piscatoe Indians because the, court, the quartzite, which is so plentiful around here, was actually a rare stone and perfectly suited to the arrowheads that they needed. And they cut the arrowheads in these forests and you can find the waste. And an experienced eye, I was walked through the trail by someone who knows these things, and you can actually pick up pieces in this forest. And the Piscatoa, we use the asphalt, what's today the asphalt paved trail that runs parallel to Rock Creek. It's a reasonable inference that they went down to that trail, and the logical way to go was probably what is today Ireland Drive, the carriage trail, but we don't really know that in any reliable way. The recorded history of this trail begins pretty early, but not that early. In 1736, an illustrious American Revolutionary War family, the Carroll family, bought what is called Joseph's Park, 3,182 acres that comprise today's Forest Glen, including this entire area out to Georgia Avenue, what's today Georgia Avenue, and down to Rock Creek, uh, and it included what is today the land that the uh, Mormon Temple stands on. In 1751, Eleanor Carroll uh, moved after the death of her husband to Joseph's Park and established her home on what is today the intersection of Seminary Road and I think it's uh, Monroe or one of those uh, cross streets. There was a house. Of course, it looked nothing like what you see today. It was all forest at the time. Uh, in 1774, Eleanor's daughter Anne and her new husband, Robert Young Brent, another prominent family we'll talk about, moved to what is today the um, 
Army, uh, 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 the, the uh, Walter Reed Annex, uh, and, where the, and built a house known as Edgewood, which was considered one of the leading houses of Maryland. It features in historic books of the state. Uh, and it stood where the commissary is today. Unfortunately, in the 1960s, it was burnt down in order to pave the parking lot. Uh, and they established a plantation, a tobacco plantation. This whole plateau that we were on was all tobacco. Like much of the American colonies at the time, it was built for or was created for export of tobacco to the mother country, England, and was really an economic colony. Uh, the um, Carroll family initially uh, rented the land to tenant farmers who grew tobacco here. And in order to bring their tobacco to market, they, they, they packed the tobacco in these barrels known as hogsheads. And the hogsheads were rolled down a tobacco rolling road, the original Ireland Drive carriage trail, uh, beginning in 1774. The trail was paved with, um, it had what's known as corduroy paving. These were logs laid crosswise to the trail, were tethered logs with ropes around them to hold them in position. Their purpose was to slow the rolling of the barrels as they went down the hill. You may have noticed, those of you who have used Ireland Drive, the carriage trail, that it's almost entirely downhill for its length. This is not by accident. They needed a route that didn't require propulsion by human energy or pulling by horses. They could actually roll the hogsheads, which weighed as much as 1,000 pounds, down this corduroy road. And that was with wooden bridges, by the way, over the various ravines where the concrete bridges are today. And that was the beginning of Ireland Drive. It was a tobacco rolling road. The Carroll family was an illustrious family. Eleanor, uh, rather, uh, 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 Anne's brother, uh, uh, Daniel, was one of the 39 original signers of the Constitution of the United States. At the Constitutional Convention, he was the most active lobbyist for uh, the uh, First Amendment uh, provision that provides for freedom of religion. And the reason is that the Carroll family was one of the most important Catholic families in the new colonies. You might know that the state of Maryland was in, it, in, its, in its origin kind of a refuge for Catholics who were not welcome in many of the other American colonies. There was even violence at the time. That's not our subject. And uh, 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 Anne's brother, um, uh, John Carroll, established the first, or one of the first, Roman Catholic parishes in the whole United States, right up here where Rosensteel Cemetery is, if you travel that way on Forest Glen Road. Uh, and you can still see traces of actually the rebuilt parish house. Uh, and he also became the first Roman Catholic bishop in the United States and the first Roman Catholic archbishop in the United States and founded Georgetown University. And he lived right here. And um, uh, I already mentioned that, uh, that Daniel Carroll, now Daniel Carroll was a friend of George Washington and Madison. And um, uh, Anne and her husband, Robert Young Brent, had a son named Robert also, who went on to be appointed by President Thomas Jefferson as the first mayor of Washington, DC. And he lived right here at Edgewood, where the commissary stands today. Well, all of that is the origin of the trail, built as a tobacco rolling road. But after a few decades, the growing of tobacco here ended, because it couldn't really compete with the superior Virginia tobaccos. The market was saturated with, oh, I don't think I explained how the tobacco got to market. They rolled it down to Rock Creek, and on Rock Creek, 
We don't exactly know, but we believe that Rock Creek was deeper at the time than it is today. We know that the seminary used it for canoeing, for example. There was a canoe house, and that wouldn't be possible today. It's too rocky and too shallow. So we know that even this section of the creek was deeper at the time. And we have stories of the use of Rock Creek uh, as a commercial transit way. And uh, it's a reasonable guess that the tobacco was carried to market by putting it on what are called bateaux or flatboats. Thomas Jefferson, you'll see if you get a chance to read this booklet, used those on a, on a similar creek in Virginia. And it probably was what happened here. And they carried them down to Georgetown, and from Georgetown they were exported um, back to uh, Great Britain. So, but tobacco, uh, a few decades later fell into uh, uh, the tobacco uh, farming um, was obsolete. Uh, uh, by the 1870s, the B&O Railroad was built, and it was no longer necessary to use Rock Creek as a transit way. There was much more efficient railroad transit right here. You can still see, obviously, the railroad tracks today. And, um, and the... the um, uh, uh, area became an ordinary uh, uh, farm for uh, vegetables and, and whatnot. Well, to, to make this a little brief, let me just jump ahead to 19, uh, in, in 1894, the National Park Seminary is founded, and the girls at the seminary used the trail as a courtesy of a local farmer. The, the seminary did not originally own the trail but it used the trail as a bridle path down to Rock Creek for the horses. There was, uh, the seminary had uh, a, a, an original stable which burnt down and was replaced by Carroll House, which is today the, uh, is about to cease use as a men's shelter, but was the original um, stables for the horses of the National Park Seminary. And what they did was to use these trails. And what, uh, this uh, uh, carriage trail was originally a bridle path, and there were also carriages on it, how it came to be called the carriage trail. But in 1928, President Ament of the National Park Seminary bought the farm, Edgewood, or what was left of Edgewood, and the adjacent forest from the farmers who owned it, and renamed it Amondale and added it to the National Park Seminary and began the process of paving the trail. Now we don't know as much as I would like to know about the paving of the trail. If you study it, it's paved to a degree that doesn't make sense if all you were going to do is ride horses on it. it the bridges are huge. They are, they are two lanes wide. My theory, which I admit to you I cannot prove is that there were public funds involved. It happened to be paved at the beginning of the Great Depression, which as you remember began in 1929. It makes no sense that President Ament would have had the funds to pave this trail from 1928 to 1932. Why do I pick 1932? Because the first photograph of the completed paved trail appears in the yearbook of the seminary in 1932. With Fred Gervasi's help we went through all the old yearbooks and that's the first time it shows up. Well, that makes no sense. These are the earliest years of the worst economic downturn in American history. So I believe, I have no evidence, that somewhere there is a record of probably Works Project Administration support, I would guess, because the, the trail also has some artsy touches if you look at it carefully. Anyway, that's all guesswork. What we know for sure is that the trail belonged at that point to the National Park Seminary and was an integral part of the life of the seminary. There are many photographs of seminary women using the trail and, and with horses and on foot and with parasols and all kinds of uh, uh, ceremonial uses. Uh, there was a canoe house down on Rock Creek and a canoe area for the, for the uh, students. Uh, the canoe house, by the way, we believe to be at exactly the point that in 100 years earlier, the hogsheads were dumped in the water. Uh, because it's a logical point if you study the, 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 the trajectory of the trail. In 1942, 
Barbara has something. Well, I just thought it was a good time to show you the map of what the trail actually looks like. Um, so you can see it looks pretty much you like that. Here. here, Steve, here's this thing. You are here. Uh, just about here. And over here are the new townhomes. Oh, I'm sorry. And here, That's all right. And the trailhead is behind the new townhomes, for those of you who haven't been on it. And it grows in an arc. Barbara said uh, that they were going to build a fence and cut off the southern third of the trail. That's this part, which, by the way, is the most beautiful part. It goes along a very deep creek. And it's quite a, quite a beautiful scene and a deep gorge. And thanks to Barbara's efforts, that is not going to happen. <coughs> Over here is the county trail, the asphalt trail. Here's the wooden bridge. Here's Jones Mill Road. Anyway, in 1942, as you know very well if you've been active with Save Our Seminary, as Barbara and I have tried to be supporters of Save Our Seminary, and I should say that Save Our Trail is really, a, in effect, a sister organization of Save Our Seminary. In an informal way, it was given birth by uh, Save Our Seminary, uh, especially by Fred Gervasi. And uh, uh, in 1942, as you know very well, the United States Army took possession of the National Park Seminary. And incidental to that transfer of property, it came into ownership of the Island Drive carriage trail and of the surrounding forests. And uh, it was not pri primarily the Army's goal to, to take the trail. They w focused more on the buildings. But their interest in this property was very much because of the pastoral setting. These were wounded soldiers coming back from horrific experiences overseas. And they wanted them to be in a, in, in a supportive and very warm environment. So it was very much the forest, I might add, that it's no accident that the original Forest Inn uh, resort, which later on became the National Park Seminary, was put here because of the forest too. So I would argue that the seminary and the surrounding forest have been locked together from, from the beginning. And, and the invitation tonight to talk about this trail at a Save Our Seminary meeting is completely logical extension of, of the relationship of the trail to the seminary for all, of these, for all of these years. And now our neighborhoods are affected very much by the presence of the forest and the trail. Well, with the passage of the years, the Army gave, finally um, gave up the uh, ownership of the historic buildings. I won't recite that because it's amply familiar to save our seminary members. Um, but they did not give up ownership of the trail. In a separate set of land concessions, the Army also gave over to the Parks Department parcels of the forest, but not of the trail. And the Army held on to the trail and roughly 15 to 20 acres adjacent to the trail. If you look at what the Army owns today, the trail hugs the edge of the fence of the Walter Reed Annex uh, for much of its length. And the Army owns the land between the fence and the trail and another 20 feet or so to the far side of the trail and has given up the rest of the forest. When Barbara started out, her core goal was to get the Army to uh, relinquish the trail because it didn't, on the face of it, seem logical for the United States Army to own a facility used by the public for hundreds of years with this wonderful history and, uh, uh, and, and this uh, rich uh, cultural value, there isn't a whole lot of um, land as unspoiled as this inside the Beltway anywhere. This is a remarkable thing that we are right here and we have this, and, and for the Army to own it doesn't seem logical. So in the beginning, it seemed a no-brainer to want the Army to relinquish it to the County Parks Department. As Barbara proceeded, I think she's already explained, she came to the conclusion that maybe this wasn't as self-evident as it seemed. The biggest problem she faced in the beginning was that the, the, the deteriorating bridge was going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to repair, and the county parks department simply didn't have anything like that. Well, amazingly, thanks to uh, Barbara's work with Congressman Chris Van Hollen and others, she got the Army to invest $450,000 
to rebuild a bridge that is used by you and me, and for those of you who haven't used it yet, you owe it to yourself to do that, uh, and, and in effect to guarantee that this trail would be available in perpetuity. And I might add, in defense of the Army, that every time a tree falls, they're out there very quickly with the chainsaws. They have been incredibly cooperative. And I think uh, that I speak for Barbara that she's come full circle to think that in the reality of the situation we're in, the budgetary situation, we are actually better off with the stewardship of the Army for now than the Parks Department, which unfortunately and unjustly is strapped for funds. But we still have a problem. The Army's job is not trails. The Army's job is security. And sometimes they see security in rather an expansive way. And they had this theory for a while that they needed to close a third of the trail to build a new fence. It didn't happen. And we're past that. But it is a reminder that there is a, a kind of potential conflict between having an organization control the trail that has a different mission, a very important mission, but a different mission. Um, and there, it, it would be much better if the Parks Department were properly funded and able to take stewardship of this trail as one would think normally is, should, be, should be the case. So that broadly is the history. You'll find a lot of very colorful details in this little booklet. I should add that I was trained in political science, not history, and this is all uh, an amateur's job, but we worked very hard on it and went to many libraries and unearthed all kinds of documents. And I think it's the correct story as far as we're able to construct it. And it is a marvelous story. So I just want to close by thanking S Save Our Seminary for your hospitality. It's really an excellent partnership that we've had and uh, we, we appreciate it. But I don't know if we have any time left for questions or discussion. That's the picnic house. Barbara, do you want to explain the picnic house? Well, among the things that the, that the seminary built, there's one inside the forest. There was a picnic house for use uh, b uh, by the girls for, you know, picnics and for special events. And it's really quite a beautiful structure. A lot of silt has built up around it, so it's not as high today as it was. But it's a stone structure. We would like to see it restored. We at least would like to see its rate of decay slowed down. We're, we're installing a, um, a jack to stop this chimney from collapsing because the lint, lintel has broken. Um, but uh, we can't do very much as amateurs. But it's, it's, it's our hope that eventually the picnic house will be restored and be a focal point. Unfortunately, with the closing of the gate at the southern leg of the trail, you know the southern leg of the trail goes right back up into the Walter Reed uh, property. And in recent years, for very sensible reasons, uh, the level of security at Army facilities has gone up. And this is an important biological research facility, and they need security. Unfortunately, part of the price of that was that the southern leg is cut by a chain link fence, the northern leg. The one right here is not, but the southern leg. So the only way to get to the southern leg is the long way from the, from the northern leg. I urge you to do that. As I said earlier, it's the prettiest part of the trail uh, and the most pastoral. It's completely, I, you won't believe you're in Washington, DC. You're going to think you're in Colorado or someplace. It's, it's really incredible. Please. So is that uh, building currently owned by the Army? The building is owned by the Army, but they are, have nothing but goodwill. They would be very happy if somebody wanted to restore it. I'm not sure they're going to do it, but uh, it, there's no resistance to uh, preserving it. They're very you know, supportive of the idea. Please. Uh, I know that as long as Fort Detrick meets uh, large public relations benefits uh, to counter the various uh, accusations and probably justify the environmental detritus that they have caused in its aim headquarters, you are in prime position to use that as leverage to give them the opportunity to show their goodwill. And the second part of that question is, do you have any sense of what kind of uh, uh, slush is coming out of their facility that might go into the environment? 
Well, uh, to the question of the Army's goodwill, I, I agree with you. Uh, the environmental effort is probably a mitigation for the sins they committed in the past. Nevertheless, it's fine with me. Uh, they, as far as the history uh, of the of the area in general, they in the last meeting the Army promised that they were going to actually hire a historian to. This, you know, to see if they could find other things that could be historically preserved. However, the Army does, isn't, is anyone besides Don here from the Army? Aha, very good. Uh, I, you know, it's a funny, those of you who know the Army may understand this, but it's like, I'm, they can't accept the research we've done, I think. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We do hope that they follow through on their promise to uh, preserve and rebuild the picnic house. Did I answer your question? I, I was curious about the environmental fallout from the obvious research oh, yes. that's going on across the street. Oh, um, yes. When uh, Fort Detrick took the property, they did a very, very thorough environmental study, and they have a long-term environmental plan to uh, correct whatever needs to be corrected there. Some of the property was used as a dump, not for uh, horrible waste, but just plain old rubble. And they plan to remove that. And I think, you know, they're going little by little to restore uh, the, the health of the, of the native uh, or the natural environment. I, at, as far as the tributary, uh, for example, bringing bad things down, um, I think that the only thing we see there are, is some trash that comes off the parking lot. And I have asked them to do some kind of restraining thing there, though uh, I haven't heard anything. Um, we'll see. We've had occasional discharges into the stream from uh, 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 industrial chemicals. You, you don't know quite what they are. Well, when we have very heavy rains, as you know, sometimes we have sewerage that gets into our streams and so on. And that was one of the reasons I thought it was very important to keep that part of the trail open to the public, because otherwise, who would know? You know, when I walk on the trail, I have my cell phone and I have the EPD phone number there. And if I see something, I, I call them. Uh, we caught some, some horrible person, uh, I won't tell you all about it, but who dumped really bad chemicals in the spillway, deliberately in There's the spillway over there. Working on all right. The and that made the news. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so that was a case where somebody ran up to tell me about it. I called the number, I ran around. So, so it's up to all of us to keep our eye on things like that, because once it passes and goes through, it's gone. Uh, it's in Rock Creek, then it's in the Chesapeake Bay, and you know, it's not like it 10 hours, or they come out. The inspectors, they come out like four hours later, it's over. So I, I don't know what to, the solution is of that kind of environment. But we, one of our neighbors has taken on a project with force to be a, a, a custodian for the streams on the property. So. They what? Right. Oh, yes, the yes. The National Park the Army to the well, exactly. I mean, that was my. Fort Dietrich, uh, that was my, you know, that was my theory when I sort of. Yes, thank you. I, I mean, I feel the same yeah. way. Uh, you know, that's the reason I had the nerve <laughs> to sort of claim it for the public. Um, Yes.
This, this is another one of those paradoxes. When we first heard that the, uh, that, that, that the uh, control of the annex was passing from a, a local institution, Walter Reed Hospital, to a distant institution, Fort Detrick, we were worried because logic seems to suggest out of sight, out of mind, they would neglect it and it would be hard to get their attention. But go figure. We're actually getting far more cooperation and uh, much more intense involvement. The commandant of Fort Detrick has been personally involved uh, in several of these steps and uh, very supportive. Before everyone leaves, I, I, I don't know if, if everyone in the room realizes that the Army is building a new uh, medical museum right across the street, just this side of the railroad tracks. It's a small building, but it's going to be completely open to the public every single day of the year, except maybe Christmas, free. And it, to my mind, one of the best things is they promise to have a room that can be used for the community for community meetings. So I'm really looking forward to that. That's a, a case of one other unbelievable benefit that we get from living here. So keep your eye on that. That's supposed to be open in, I think, September 2011. Do you have a question about that? What has been identified? I can't West Nile. Well, West Nile virus. Nile virus. Oh. They, they identify that every year. Mm -hmm. So this is not something new. Really talk about it. Just for a moment, since this idea of safety came up, I think it's always a good idea to carry your cell phone. I don't know of any crime at all. I mean, everybody you meet is smiling and happy. But if you were to fall and injure yourself, you know, you should have a cell phone, and it would be good to have in your cell phone the, the Army police because the county police don't really operate on Army property. So I just want to recommend that um, carry your cell phone. I don't think so. Many years ago. Someone did report that some young folks were building a tree house. Yes. I think that was taken care of. I never saw it. I mean, you know, you can understand why someone would want to do that, but it's not a good idea. Thank you again. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay.